Did you ever wonder what could have been with the AWA had things gone differently? Had their fortunes gone differently? Had certain wrestlers not left and perhaps more money would have been at the disposal of the Ganyas? Well, wonder no further. You can go to Brad Drake's YouTube channel and experience the 1987 Supermod for yourself. As Brad Drake starts off in May 1987, along with Greg Gagne, Baron Von Rotschke, Vern Gagne himself, Nick Bockwinkle, Larry Zabisco, Kurt Hennig, and a slew of others as he plays and saves the AWA. Do you ever wonder what would happen if, well, if... If you give a dad a podcast. I'm what you call a nerdy fan. I nerd out at this stuff, hardcore. You'll hear me talk about anime on here. You'll hear me talk about Power Rangers. You'll hear me talk about wrestling on here. Okay. I had an axe handle with a twisted T on it. There is <laughs> right after that twisted T video went viral. And man, they went out and grabbed it and smacked a dude in the head with it. It was so... That's great. That's- I'd like to thank this podcast as a nostalgia moment for me. It's a show where I can talk about whatever I want. I'm a, I'm a human and I'm a chiropractor. There was a picture of me. It looked like I was on the side of a ramen box over in China. But... <laughs> so I took my kids with me to Comic-Con. I thought that was really cool. Well, I don't know if my wife should listen to this podcast. We'll cut that part out. <laughs> you know, you be like, and then Robert said this. <laughs> if you give a dad a podcast, available now on all podcasting platforms. Thank you for joining another edition of Thumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I'm Brian Ferguson. My guest today is well-known throughout the pro wrestling community. He has held numerous singles and tag team titles, best known for his time in WCW and WWC tag teaming with Ricky Santana as Los Specialistas. Is that how you say it? Well, we we wrestled as in WCW as El Specialistia. Then we went okay. on to become the Barrio Brothers. Okay. Uh, Ricky, one of the best partners I've ever had in the business. All right. We, did, we teamed up in the World Wrestling Council. Yeah. A lot of great matches all over the world together. Yeah. And I want to welcome in Mr. Fidel Sierra and his manager slash wife, <laughs> Fantasy. Thanks, guys, for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much for having us. We appreciate yeah. it. We're excited to be here. Oh yeah, I'm I'm so excited. I I do remember you guys and 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 the wrestling and uh, when you guys were teaming with Ricky and all that. Even under the mask, I mean, what yeah. was great is you guys had such the similar builds that it was hard to tell. Yeah, and that was the point of it, I guess, with the mask that. And we could actually do the switch like twins could do. Switch. Yeah, and you wouldn't know the difference. So, yeah, it's great to have you on. Thank you. I would like to start if we could, Fidel. Growing up, you're from Florida. Yes, sir. Uh, let's talk a little bit about if we could growing up in Florida. Uh, your your parents and everything, what they've done, and 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 your schooling, if we could. My, with my well, I uh, grew up in a place West Tampa, Florida. And uh, uh, my parents, you know, were my mom from Cuba, my father from Spain. And, you know, uh, we were, it was great, you know, that what a, they brought me up the best they could. The only thing at the age of uh, 12, you couldn't get me away from watching wrestling. And I knew that that's what I was going to do when I grew up. And I had, I had challenges. During that time where uh, one time a coach told me I was never going to amount to nothing. And uh, and I said, no, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. No, you're not going to amount to nothing. What a thing to tell a junior high school student, right? And uh, my first year in wrestling, I forget how much I made, but I went back and I went to that school. He was still there. I said, I made over $65,000 last year. How much did you make? And I'm a pro wrestler, just said I would never be. 
Wow. Wow. I read, and I need to know if you were trained under Hiro Matsuda. Yes, sir. Before Hiro. Yes. There was a, they would call it outlaw wrestling. Okay. That an independent, like there is these days, it was called outlaw wrestling. So I would wrestle on Friday nights, 50 miles from my house for 20, 25 bucks. I was learning the business. I was like a natural. I just uh, trained with some judo people and, and all. I got there, had my first match with a guy named uh, uh, Donnie York Sr. And while wow, the people were like right so behind me, like I was an instant baby face. And I was like, oh, 300 <laughs> people, uh, standing room only at a fire station in Withlacoochee, Florida. And uh, and I got paid 20 bucks. And I was like, well, I got tw paid 20 bucks to wrestle eight minutes or 10 minutes. Wow. That's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> that, but I've heard some horror stories about training under Hero, uh, the, the conditions. Can you kind of describe your okay, training, so, if you would? Okay. So then for after all that outlaw wrestling, then uh -huh. I went to the Sportatorium. Uh, Hero was teaching me to go to get me ready for a tour of Japan. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I was there when he was training people like Ron Simmons, God oh. bless the late Ed DeBoe Gadner. Uh, you know, he already had trained people like Brian Blair. He put them through a lot harder stuff than he put me through. Mm -hmm. But he still would, you know, he would stretch me a little bit and just try to teach me the right way. And he said, this is how the style you're going to have to work when you go to Japan. If not, I can't never send you back because they ain't going to like you. And, mm -hmm. and I was lucky I might, you know, he, you know, he trained me. And, and then I ended up going to Japan later on. So Japan, I've heard a lot of good things about Japan. I've never heard a bad story about wrestlers that went over to Japan as far as payouts, as far as the uh, the atmosphere. Uh, was that a similar experience you had? Did you have well, that? You, my first tour was a five-week tour, New Japan Pro Wrestling. Okay. But I was so lucky because I, I'm, I'm, I had the training. And before that, I had gone to Dallas and all that. But we'll talk a little bit about that. But I was so lucky that I got to I got to L.A. to go to fly from L.A. straight to Japan. And there yeah. was Vic Murdoch, God bless his soul, and the mass superstar. And Dick Murdoch was right away ribbing me. You know, he said, you ain't going to last two weeks in Japan. You're going to pay for yourself to fly back home. <laughs> and my superstar would say, don't pay attention to him. He's just trying to rib you already. But uh, I was lucky I got there. And it was the first match. I was was me and Andre the Giant, God bless us, so against Antonio Inoki and... Uh, uh, a guy named Sakaguchi or whatever. And I was wow. like, oh, I'm teaming with Andre. But Andre, you know, he liked me. If Andre yeah. didn't like you, you're in trouble. He, you know, and I would say, hey, boss, what do you know? He said, you just go in there, do your thing. And when I say tag me, you tag me. You know, yeah. and that's how it went. You know, it's, it's somewhere on YouTube if you look it up. But it was okay. like, hey, man, and, and I... I I was so lucky to be on a five-week tour. Yeah. And, wow. You know, and then I ended up, the thing about Japan is, like, we were there, we were a team against me and Andre, against Anoki. Then I wrestled Anoki by myself. Then uh, uh, me and somebody else, some, uh, some far, far away team against Andre and somebody. And, and, you know, so I wrestled against Andre. So it was like, what a... Uh, learning experience yeah wow it, it kicked to all that was after my five-week tour i got mm -hmm. back and hero matsuda said you're going back to japan in two weeks because i forget oh, the wow. guy, names that he trained and they were going for the first time i think one of them was uh one of the arts armstrongs 
okay. Scott Armstrong and, and his partner at that time. And we literally, literally had to go there, make sure that, you know, he said, just make sure they don't get in trouble and all that. And I said, okay, you need to be worried about me. If you'd have seen it. <laughs> Making sure they're out of old. Yeah, and so, yeah, I'm in charge not to get them. And meanwhile, my first tour there, Andre introduces me to this drink they made to this called the Black Machine. And it was, a, what it was, was a cup, this a big cup. Yeah. Tall cup full of uh, rum with a little splash of Coke. And they gave oh. it a color. So I drank the first one because I liked rum. I said, that wasn't that bad. I got to the third one. <laughs> I literally <laughs> had to run out of there. Well, if you want to call it, run a stagger out of there. In the Keo Plaza, as soon as I walked out of that uh, bar, I mean, the throw up <laughs> just flew 20 feet in the air. Oh, wow. <laughs> Yeah, exorcist. She just hit it. And then, you know, and then they had to, they ended up having to take me in the luggage cart to my room, Dick Murdoch, the superstar, Andre laughing the whole time. And uh, they dropped me off right by him next to my toilet. So in case I had to throw up, I had a place. And I woke up in the morning and I was so hungover. Here's Dick Murdoch beating on the door. <laughs> and I open the door and I'm like, he goes, hey, baby, we're going to the gym and get a sauna to sweat that stuff out of you and all that. And I'm like, I ain't going nowhere. I'm going to bed. <laughs> but I ended up going to the sauna and all that. But it was. <laughs> wow. But that was That's great pretty... there in Japan. Yeah. Yeah. So you get back to the States. I see you did a lot of time in, uh, in Portland. Florida. Yes, where was your main, I guess, hub when you first started out besides okay. Japan? Where did you get a lot of your experience? Okay, so in 1978, Rocky Johnson, God bless us so, Adamavia Johnson, mm -hmm. and the late King Curtis, they sent me to the Von Erichs. Gary Hart was the booker. Sent me to the Von Erichs. Great time. I got the wrestle for the Von Erics on Monday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or whatever. And then Wednesday or Tuesday, I'd be right back. I'd be for Joe Blanchard in the San Antonio area. Friday, I'd be for Paul Bosch. Then I'd be right back for the Von Erics. So, okay. and so then I wrote a lot of Bronco Lubitsch, and that led me to be then sent on to Mid Atlantic, which okay. I love up there too. But I would say my most favorite place was Portland because yeah. I got to wrestle there under three different characters. Held, I'm the only three different character guy that held every belt there was in the Northwest. And oh, Don, wow. Yeah, and Don Owens uh, was so good to me. And to the God bless, he was such a great promoter, good payoff man. Were you a tag team champion without a tag team partner? Yeah, at one point she had the door. Oh, on time. She's being smart ass, but it's yeah. Trip. At one point, I had all the belts <laughs> and the tag belt with no tag partner. Well, how did you do that? I got. I got to ask. How did you do that? that? My tag partner somehow something went wrong and left. So instead of they just and then. You know, but then later on, me and Ricky went on to hold those tag belts. Uh, but yeah. before that, I was part of Buddy Rose's army. Me, okay, Rip the Crippler Oliver, and Playboy Buddy Rose was the leader. Then yeah. later on, I came back as the assassin and um, team with a mask, even though there was Jody, who was the original assassin. Yeah. And then it became Rip Oliver's clan because Buddy Rose had left to New York. So it was me, Rip Oliver, and Dinah, my kid. And we were feuding with Kurt Henning. God bless us. Kurt Henning's first sellout was against me as the oh, uh, wow. destroyer. As, no, as the assassin. Jay Youngblood's first sellout was against me as a destroyer. Wow. Well, they're learning new stuff here all the time. That's that's I didn't know that. See, that's yeah, I'm sure a lot of fans don't know that. 
And That's then they switched me. And then I, then the, I left to Japan another one of those times and lost a loser, leave town as the assassin. Came back as the movie Top Gun had just come out. So I came back ah. with the music. Da, 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 da. Yeah. People ate it up. I mean, I killed it on Polaroid pictures. I fused it with <laughs> Buddy Rose, Rip Oliver. It was unreal. And so wow. a lot of great memories in, in Oregon. Yeah. You know. I, I saw a lot. You won a lot of tag team titles with, with Rip Oliver. Yes, sir. Uh, up there in, in Portland. Uh, yes, what sir. was it like working with, with, with Rip? I mean, that was one of your main guys besides Ricky. What was that? Like Rip, you working with? Rip and Ricky are right there head to head as the best tag team partners I've ever had in this pro okay. wrestling business. And yeah. man, me and Rip were like, it's like me and Ricky. We both knew what each other was thinking. He tagged me, whatever. We It was like a well-oiled machine the way we would. Yeah. Uh, team up and do our stuff in the ring and, wow. and you know then later on with Ricky it was the same way I, yeah. I couldn't have asked for no better tag team partners than I had back then and then when yeah. Dynamite kid, kid came in and he was yeah. he Dynamite Kid and ripped the Cripper Oliver and it was Oliver's clan and we were battling Kurt Henning Playboy Buddy Rose who had turned baby face oh my gosh the territory was on fire yeah, I I noticed you were a lot in Portland, Florida, uh, Puerto Rico. What was your experience like in Puerto Rico at the WWC, World Wrestling Council? Oh, uh, great. Uh, yeah. First time there, 1985. Great matches. Uh, first match, the first time there on TV, me and this, I can't think of M Mongo or something. Uh, a guy had like the ponytail, like uh, the missing link, and we okay. team, we beat up uh, Ch Jumping Joe Savoti and uh, and Al Perez. Yeah. And okay. We beat, beat them with the uh, their radio, and then uh, they come out. They would come out like the rock and roll stuff with their me, and we got them both. <laughs> and we were both bleeding. We stomped the yeah. radio instantly. I, I tell you, I never got to work in, um, you know, Portland. I just heard a mm -hmm. lot of stories, and I wish I would have had the opportunity. But I yeah. joined him in 92, and it was, you know, my first time managing him was at the World Famous Sportatorium in Tampa. Okay. But, yeah. Um, then we went to Puerto Rico. I had one of the, you know, few opportunities to, to um, work there and, um, you know, accompany accompany him to the ring but i tell you there is nowhere not nobody like the puerto rican wrestling fans they are very um to be nice enthusiastic about wrestling <laughs> they take it very right. serious and they're very they're, proud of their they're some of the most awesome wrestling fans unless you're a heel and then better watch out because oof it was rough. It was scary, but yeah. A lot of fun, yeah. Well, let's bring you in here a little bit, Fantasy. Uh, how did you start out? I mean, did you just meet Fidel and then decided, hey, I want to work with you? Or were you a female wrestler? Or no, how did this come I, all about? I never really wrestled a lot. I was in the ring with a few, um, you know, females but never really formally trained. And I grew up in Europe. Okay. And, you know, unlike Fidel here, who knew he wanted to be a wrestler and loved it, I didn't really know much about it, didn't care for it. I had other things going on until yeah. I came, moved to Houston, Texas. And my dad was a big wrestling fan, God bless his soul. And he took me to one of the live matches at the Houston Coliseum where Paul Bosch was Paul running. Bosch, yeah. And just that atmosphere, the, uh, you know, how athletic these guys were, the show mm -hmm. they put on, I was instantly fascinated. I knew I wanted to be part of it. Um, I met a few people. I ended up uh, meeting Fidel. 
Um, then we kind of went our separate ways for a short while. Then we reconnected. Uh, we became really good friends. Um, and the rest is history. I started, you know, I, I started uh, managing him. And I tell you, it, it, for me, it was such an amazing experience uh, to yeah. be able to come out of my shell, the growth, yeah. the, because I am not a, out, I was not an outgoing person. I was not a vicious person or a heel personality. Yeah. And, you know, the first time he takes me out there, I'm like, oh my God, what do I do? You know, and then we <laughs> had like a, um, a TV show we had to do and he goes, don't worry, you're just going to sit there. And, you know, I do all the talking. And then, God bless, it was Shannon Rose's TV. And he's gone, too. It's so sad. He hands yeah. me a list of, you know, 20 potential questions. And I'm like, what do you mean I have to talk? You know, <laughs> oh, it, I was so nervous and scared. I thought I was just going to stare like a deer in the headlight into the TV and when he asked me something, I wouldn't be able to put two words together. But I muddled through, I overcame my um, challenges and yeah. you know, with Her the first. guidance of uh, Fidel and Ricky and a lot of other talent, I, you and know. But her first time in Puerto Rico, she experienced a riot. <laughs> yeah, the first time we, yeah, that was <laughs> in the yeah, that was my initiation into that. That was your initiation, right? Wow. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it was it's been a Hello everyone. This is Brian Ferguson, the host of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I want to tell you about a new podcast out called Fouls Count Anywhere. It is a classic pro wrestling pro podcast that brings you the legends of wrestling with true wrestling fans Chris DiCarlo and Charlie Turner. They bring on guests that are legends in this business, as well as wrestlers of today, promoters, referees, you name it. They have them on there, folks. And I encourage you to listen to them. If you're on YouTube, watch them. They drop every Saturday. They have their podcast. They drop it in the afternoon. So look forward to that podcast coming out. Falls Count Anywhere podcast with Chris DiCarlo and Charlie Turner. Folks, you will not be disappointed. I guarantee it. And enjoy the podcast. Fidel, I want to talk to you a little bit about your teaming with Ricky. You know, I had an interview with him a few weeks back. Yes. Speaks very, very highly of you and your time together. You guys were a great tag team in in WCW both and, and and World Wrestling Council. Why? I, I guess my question is, you guys were a hot commodity in WCW, I thought, and a lot of people thought, but yeah. you never got, got the, the opportunity to exactly. get those belts. I, can I mean, why? The, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, why was that? Was it a well, misunderstanding? I or Okay. I can tell you, it's a me and Ricky were like a great tag team we had this all this potential it was like any match whoever we worked we were like well-oiled machines and we did uh, uh great tag matches and um it was all the politic parts you know like we were supposed to get signed and they weren't going to sign us uh you know then uh i was told we we're going to get signed for sure and it didn't happen. And then Ricky said, that's it, brother. I can't take it no more. I'm I'm going, you know, I, he goes, I'm going to Puerto Rico. I pulled over. I called Carlos Colon and went to Ricky and said, listen, Ricky, I'm going to put you on with Ricky. And he's talking to you. Boom, boom, boom. Next thing you know, Ricky was back in Puerto Rico and we were, and I stayed in WCW. But we had that problem there where we should have got a contract and it didn't work out. At one point, yeah. her with us should have got a contract. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we promised it. Then at the end, a few days before we we're supposed to sign, somebody stabbed us in the back politically, and it didn't happen. And the yeah. same thing happened to me and Ricky in WWF at that time. Before it was WWE, yeah. is 
We went there. They loved us. Uh, they brought a different manager. That yeah. was their biggest No, that was, that was the second time. But, oh, okay. Yeah. But, so we went there, and uh, uh, Ricky didn't see eye to eye with somebody that he was with, and I don't know if he talked about it, so I don't want to bring it up if he didn't. Okay, that's no problem, yeah. yeah. And so that person walked by, acted like he didn't even know us, and Ricky, because they all know. He went and asked him what was the problem. Anyway, I knew that person had enough pull because the next thing, we won one tag match, we lost another one, and then uh, Vince said, we'll be in contact, whatever, not never will panned out. So when she's talking about the next time we went, okay. so the next time we went is me, Ricky, and Fonzie, Bill Alfonso, mm -hmm. was going to manage us. And I thought it was great. So Vince is so good. He, I mean, he, he like, hey, how you guys doing? Da, 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 da. He said, I can tell you right now, the worst thing you did is bring him with you. And we looked at Fonzie. And I don't know why, but it was he didn't act like Fonzie. I, I don't know if that was an inside rib, but the bottom line is <laughs> to get hired. You know, wow. Because Fonzie was great. You know, we we all traveled up and down the road with Fonzie. He's one of the best yeah. managers was out there in ECW and, and best referee before that in the world to me. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard uh, you know, politics plays a, a big part um, in uh in wrestling. And uh you're on the wrong side, it uh, unfortunately uh can, I'll tell you one can hurt you. Yeah, another time, Eric Bischoff, this is separate from, it's just me, and she's there. Eric Bischoff says, go to go to Sting. He, he's going to tell you where he gets, get this outfit like this. You're going to be not, you're not going to be Mexican, but you're, it's going to be like your mix of a Latin, which, you know, and I said, no problem. And he said, and she will be managing you and all that, and I'm going to sign you a contract, all that. And I know it was Ole Anderson to put the knives in our back because Ole was there and Ole didn't care for me and I don't care. I don't care for him either. And uh, and so it never happened. And, and I know that that's why. Yeah, that was. And you know, Eric Bischoff never explained it like that. Yeah. And I'm the only guy that I can tell you right now in WCW. Had a feud with Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Jimmy Hart was in charge of WCW Saturday night at 6.05. Yep. He had Duggan get that TV belt out of the garbage can. I beat Duggan. We worked an angle. I beat Duggan, but not for the title, to build up for the title. Yeah. Um, the ratings on that Saturday that they showed that was the either a 3-1 or a 3-2, and Nitro with Hogan and whoever did like a 3-8. They said... Too close for comfort. Yeah, quote, unquote, in the deal with Sierra and Duggan right now to Jimmy Hart. And he had to end it. And Jimmy probably wouldn't say that because Jimmy's such a great person and yeah. you know, that he would never say that that's the way. But I know that's the way it went down. You know what? Right. That's you would think that in a situation like that, they would take advantage of a certain, you know, angle, personality, whatever, yeah. draw and give it to the people. It's just everybody's going to make money. And, right. you know, when, like, when ECW was big, we, they were in Tampa a few times. And the first time, we've never been on ECW TV. We came yeah. out, they gave us music, we got to talk on the mic, and we had such a strong reaction from the fans yeah. that it was like, wow. And yeah. then the following time, um, we didn't get any music. We might have got a few minutes on the mic. Yeah, and, and then Paul, the third time, Paul Heyman put the break. Paul and Heyman like, put the brakes of that. Why? Why? I mean, obviously, you've got something here. And yeah. you just, you know, it's because a lot, I think a lot of it has to do with 
if it wasn't the person in charge idea, then it they didn't want it. They buried it. And you yeah. know, unfortunately. So but uh and I, on, on that cheerful note, gentlemen, I <clears throat> have a conference call. So I'm gonna leave you to chat. Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, and, thank you for coming on and, yeah. and I've enjoyed our conversation. You've a lot a lot we'll of good insight. Have, so I appreciate we'll it. We'll do we'll do it again one of these you days. Bet. All right, take <laughs> care. So uh, so you know the, the crazy part about all that is like Hacksaw was so mad. I can yeah. remember we we wrestled either Orlando or somewhere. And the people were so into the match. And I mean, we we, we, we hadn't even locked up. And they were USA, USA. And it was crazy. And we came back from the match. And I remember Doug then slang, slung the TV belt and it hit the wall. And Ric Flair said, what, what's, what's going on? What happened? What went wrong? And I said, no, he's just, he's tired of it the same way we are that, such a reaction and they ain't going nowhere with it. They're just, you know, yeah. third match and we should be, you know, they should have took advantage of it, did some angles yeah. out of it, but they didn't. Yeah, that it's, it's a, a lot of eat. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, I've never been a part of it, but from what I've been learning since starting this podcast is that a lot of egos get in the way of, of doing business. Yeah. And however that turns out, sometimes it can turn out okay, and sometimes it doesn't, you know. And and it's unfortunate that, I mean, it's human nature, but it's really sad that you know you got a talent like yourself and and, and Ricky Santana when you guys were a tag team. Yes, sir. Should have been given that opportunity to carry to to wear those belts. Uh, I think you would have had a great run with them and had some great competition. Uh, and defending those belts and getting a lot of a uh, lot of heat knowledge out of it yes sir and now uh, and, and, and money i mean yeah money and money yeah and I mean, that's yeah. the diff that was the difference when we were wrestling for don owens and mm -hmm. they were pushing me hard with the top gun character rick flair came in he was already going to wrestle but he put he had me beat him in a non-title match he came back a month later, defended the world title. We did an hour draw. We do great, great, great crowds. And, but Don Owens, that was the difference. Yeah, everybody looked at Portland as, oh, Portland's just this little tiny. No, Portland had some of the best talent go through there ever. Yeah. Roddy Piper to the grappler, yeah. to me and Ricky Santana, to play by Buddy Rose, to the late Rip the Crippler Oliver. They all went through there. Yeah. And Rick Martell, the sheep herders. Yeah. I mean, you can name the who's who of, of that era, and they all were in, were in that even territory. Rick, and even Rick Martell and uh, to so many people. Kurt Henning, they groomed them. I said, Kurt Henning, do you realize, brother, we were selling out. I said, Kurt, do you realize you're just being groomed here for Vince? He would say, what do you mean? I said, watch. You just went to WWE, they sent you back here. But you're going to go back to WWE, and believe me, and that's how it happened. And they really, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I, I heard a story where Kurt went to Portland. He was the AWA world champion, and he was doing uh, Don Owens a favor. He said, I'll, I'll defend the title out there to, I don't remember who it was now, but yeah, it's a favor. And, and and so you know you can't do that nowadays. You can't just say no, oh, no. Fair. And you Kurt have to hurt neck. I, I don't know. You can't see the picture. I got it back there. Kurt had a hurt neck, so and had already had a title match. So the belt was held up. So I went in and represented Kurt. I I, I basically wrestled the grappler, and the winner okay. would be. So I won the match to hold the AWA World Title to hand it back to Kurt Henning. <laughs> Let me get the picture one second. I'm getting All right, here. yeah, yeah. Take your time. You bet. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's so, neat. That's yeah. And so 
I, I, I ribbed Kurt because Kurt was a ribber. So I, I said to Kurt, he comes in and I'm supposed to hand him the belt. And I said, <laughs> Kurt, why should I hand you the belt right now? I could keep it right now. And then, you know, they're going to have to do something else because I don't know if he had thrown pitched it to the, I forget who the commissioner was in AWA back then. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, Blackburn or I don't know. Blackburn. Yeah. Stanley Blackburn. Yeah. So, and he wouldn't go for it. Cause I said, let me, what an automatic angle. The belt was held up. Kurt couldn't because of his neck. I want it. And now I drop it back to him in Minnesota. Yeah. It would have been great, but they didn't see they, that. But that was part was they weren't thinking money or they weren't. They just said, no, that, that just ain't going to fit here. You know, and I understand how that happens. Yeah. It's too bad. I think like yourself and Ricky Santana, there's some others out there I can think of that are really, to me, under appreciated for what, what you've all right. have done. Yeah. You guys in this, you know, 80s and early 90s, you guys were the trailblazers for the, the people that are in where they're at today, getting all this recognition and money. And, and if it wasn't for the hard work and sweat of, of yourself and, and those yeah. trailblazers from the 80s, yeah. wrestling when we, you know, at one time, if I, if I remember, there was 26 territories. Yeah. If I'm right, and you went, you were in quite a few of them: Portland, Mid Atlantic. Yeah, I, was, I was in every territory except for Bill Watts's territory. Okay, I, I did one show for him because they flew me in from Dallas for a yeah. TV, but I never got to work the territory, and I did a house show for him. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah. back then you could hop around exactly and 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 make money in other places and. You know, if it wasn't a fit for you, okay, I can go from, you know, Texas to uh, Portland or, or Mid-Atlantic. And, and and now you've got two yeah, choices, yeah, really. If you're in the big now. league, you go to WWE. And if you they don't like you, you go to AEW. And if they don't like you, well, you're yeah. going to go on the indies. And, and it, I was it's, lucky. Me and yeah. Rick were lucky that we got the wrestle. Harlem Heat, the Nasty Boys. Uh, we wrestled Sting and Luger so many times. The Sting and Luger were mad that they had to wrestle us again. And we were like, <laughs> wait a minute. We're the ones putting you over. And we, <laughs> we would have 12 to 14 minute matches. And it was like, and I just, I said, me and Ricky looked at each other. Can you imagine? They're complaining and we're the ones taking bumps crazy for them, making them look like a million dollars. And they were making yeah. so much more money than us. Yeah. But yeah, we that's... had that and we had the great matches with Nasty Boys. And then here in Florida, yeah. we had so many great matches and feuds with the uh, Sheep Herders who went on to become the Bushwhackers. Yeah. We were married to them in Championship Wrestling in Florida. And we were packing them in. But we had barbed wire matches. We had yeah. bunkhouse matches. We everywhere, and uh, I was, you know, I was very fortunate to team with Ricky, hold the Florida yeah. tag team belts. Mm. I got to be myself, be Kendo Wyndham for the Florida title. You know, okay, yeah, Southern heavyweight champion here. Uh, the experience and the uh, uh, knowledge that I got back then was unreal. Yeah. I can imagine. Hey, and I want to, you know, you're going to, you were recognized a few years back uh, by the Cauliflower Alley Club. Yes, sir. Uh, you won the men's, the men's award. What was that experience like for you being honored by your, by your peers? You know? yeah, honored by my peers, inducted by Ricky Santana. Yeah. And, and I inducted him a couple of years later, but yep. that was so great because you know what? Uh, you know, that was our uh, WrestleMania uh, Hall of Fame moment. And we're mm -hmm. so, and to be part of the CAC and all the great things they do for so many good people, and Brian yeah. Blair, the president, and all the people involved, it takes more than one person. It takes a whole group. And, mm -hmm. and it's, uh, it was such an honor 
you know, and yeah, it really meant a lot. And and I tell you, who got inducted with me with the same award was Kahegas. Okay. Uh, Paul Anton, the Tokyo Monster Kahegas. Okay. But that was great too, and he yeah. you know, he he's a heck of a talent too. Who should be, you know, he has been champion, but he should be somewhere right now. AEW, WWE. He should have been there already years ago for WWE. But yeah. it's all about, you know, what they see or don't see or who's for you, who's yeah. not for you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's like you said, politics, you know, it's, it's, uh, and it's me, unfortunate, but it's the nature of the beast, you know, and, um, Hey everyone, this is Brian Ferguson, the host of Bumps and Thumps, the talk of wrestling. I want to talk about our podcast today. Our podcast is about getting stars on here from yesteryear. Professional wrestlers, referees, promoters, independent wrestlers. We get their stories out to you to relive those great memories and to live those great memories and get their story out about what they go through in everyday life. And get into that ring and what they go through, what they sacrifice, and what they're doing now. So please, join us today. Subscribe to the podcast. Go to our YouTube channel. Check it out. And subscribe. If you listen to audio, we're on almost all the platforms that provide podcasts. Check it out. Subscribe on those channels. Folks, today, you know, we need more subscribers to get our word out there, to get our brand out there, the bumps and thumps, and get people on here that require may require some financial compensation as we build this brand. We'll be able to get those people on there that require that. So folks, join today, subscribe, go to the podcast, check it out. I know you're going to love it. Talk to you soon. Take care. God bless. All right. So one more question. Actually, I know you're heading to St. Louis. Talk about What's coming up for you here in the next couple of months? We got some events going on from what okay. I understand. Uh, on uh, March 18th, okay. Okay, Florida, uh, me and Fantasy are doing a meet and greet for okay. Florida Wrestling Empire. Okay. And it's going to be great. What a They got a packed card, you know, not with a lot of big star known talent, but it's going to be one heck of a show. And uh, we're, we're, I'm so glad, and I requested an in-ring interview, and they're giving it to me, and we'll see what happens from there. But I, I really, that's March 18th. But yeah. then, uh, then you know that SI, what's it, SICW, Herb yep, Simmons. Southern Illinois Championship Wrestling, yeah. Yeah, that is, I am so honored to get to be there and be part of that. Yeah. Um I want to thank Scott Wilder, who's bringing me in to the merchandise table to sell, you know, my stuff. And I believe, I don't know who else is with me at that table, but there's so many great people being in, honored there. Yeah. You yeah. know, I, we talked about Darla earlier. She yeah, is a star star star, yeah. you know, and uh, uh, Barbara Goodish, what a mm -hmm. sweetheart. And now JJ's daughter, that's going to be a big part of CAC, but She's going to see her father inducted there in, in St. Yep. Louis, J.J. Dillon and, and Jerry Briscoe. And, you know, I got history with the Briscoe brothers here in Florida. But it, that event is going to be so big. There's so many people mm -hmm. there. J.J., yeah. you, know, you were naming some earlier. There's yeah. so many. I couldn't tell you all of them. Yeah. Cool. There are. Yeah. It's going to be great. I'm going to be there myself just there as a go. spectator. I'm going to be there as a spectator. I bought my ticket back in January before they started announcing. They had some names out already, but it, that list has grown so yeah, and dramatically. I tell you is I met Herb Simmons at CAC. Mm. He was yeah. so professional. Yep. And I, I think he's doing one great job of putting this together. Yeah. And Herb Simmons, thank you so much because yeah. you know, St. Louis Wrestling – yeah was so big. he's a he's and, a great you know, guy i've had the pleasure of meeting him outside of cac i've seen him a few times down here in springfield for some wrestling events yeah one more question if i could you know we got these two big ones right now wwe and or uh, aew excuse me but 
I'm going to be honest. I've been going to a lot of more indie shows here lately. Like we have some here in Springfield, Missouri, and I know they're around the ter- around the country. I'm going to be honest. I think they're better right now than those big ones because they don't do all that talking for 15, 20 minutes in the ring right. about um, what's your what's your opinion on that? Well, there's so many good independent promotions. Here in Florida, yeah. there's a a handful of good mm-hmm. promotions and there there's a handful of bad ones. Yeah. I'm talking about guys making fifteen dollars and just, you know, and art is made of up. And so you know you're not gonna get a good show there, but there's other independent shows here that are that really are first class yeah and i don't want to name them all because you know yeah. you know i don't, don't leave one out i don't want to leave one out i heard it but they, yeah. they really are you know yeah uh, yeah no i understand i just i i feel but, like you know i've been to a couple here in missouri there's some great promotions around here and every time I go to one, I'm so impressed with the professionalism of them, for one. Yeah. The storytelling, how they they don't talk for 15, 20 minutes in the ring. They go right. out and do their business. They might get on the mic for a minute and talk, and then they start beating people up. Yeah, here's, whatever. Uh, here's my – people say to me, Fidel Sierra, Cuban assassin. And I want to thank yeah. – wait, before we – I want to thank – the original Cuban assassin, Angel, for allowing me to have the name Cuban assassin because we were supposed to go to Japan together. It didn't work out. He said, I'll never use that in Florida. Well, and I I took advantage of it. The only thing I put Fidel Sierra in front of it. So I just yeah. wanted to take that moment to think. But you bet. Um, the deal with, there's great independent wrestling all over the world to me mm-hmm. you know but then you go to uh the, i watch people they say fidel why do you watch wwe and why do you watch aew some of it and and, and uh i said well it's i like to it's sort of my way of cheating the business change yeah. no matter whether i like it or not I mm-hmm. see, and I'm not I'm not dogging AEW. I see way right. more crazier stuff going on in AEW. I say, oh my God, how many eight mans and six mans and this and that, and how many times is this one guy going to bleed every single match I see? And and then, but then I watch WWE, and I and I understand what you're saying, but in the last couple of months. They got some good little storylines going that you have to yeah. put a little bit of time into what you're saying, yeah. where you put 10 to 15 minutes. And mm-hmm. and I look at it the same way. I look at the clock and I say, wow, that whole segment without no wrestling was 15 to 18 minutes. Yeah. Now they got to catch the people with the wrestling. So, and yeah. you know, it's they're programmed that way, the WWE yeah. fans and the AEW fans. So I'm not trying to. Right. Uh, but well, when I hear them brag, like uh, AEW people, yeah. how they're much better they are than WWE and all that. Well, I I look at the ratings. Vince yeah. has still got the best ratings, even they're not they're not what we used to do back in our day. Right. Yeah. But AEW is like you know down here, and Vince is way up there, but. You know, I wish them all the best. You know why? Because the more places you got to go, yeah. I mean, more places like that, more of the stars they can make. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, look at New Japan Pro Wrestling, everywhere they go, you know. Hey, yeah. you look at the, I should don't know if I could say her name, Sasha Banks, the women champion yeah. now. She's, yeah. she's, uh, she's got to make, you know, a ton of money on merchandise alone. Yeah. And, you know, so, yeah. but when I get back, I think the independent groups that are doing it the right way, like you just said, where they have yeah. a little tiny bit of talking, but they're telling a story in their match. It's not all, uh, like I call it, uh, uh, who can do the most high spots in a match. It's uh, good wrestling. 
then yeah. I appreciate that. And I, and I'm glad when I see that. Yeah. But when I yeah. see some of these companies do and they like, it's a spot fest out there. I'm like, Oh my God, is it somebody back there telling them, Hey, you can't do this. You know? Yeah. 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 It's, some of them are crazy, but I will say that I think, in my opinion, and the Indies are really starting to make a push to come back. Yeah, and, they are. And, and, they're starting, and, they're starting to, people thought, yeah. you know, just when everybody thought at one time, a certain big name wrestler said, are well, you going to see wrestling die completely? Well, I don't think that's ever going to happen. And no. just now, to me, like you just said, the independent wrestling starting to get better, 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 better yeah. certain companies here in yeah. Florida all over. And I'm yeah. glad to see that, you know. Yeah, um, me too. A big, a, another big person that helped me out a lot here was uh, in WCW and all over was uh, Kevin Sullivan, the devil. Yes. And great he, guy. Andrew great Anderson guy. that goes as the Purple Haze. What yep. a great, he, you know, Kevin yes. Sullivan got one heck of a mind. When, yes, he does. Let me tell you, when WCW was beating WWE on ratings, yeah. it wasn't all Eric Bischoff. It was 90-something percent gotcha. Kevin Sullivan. Yeah. yeah. Kevin Sullivan, again, uh, a guy that was, you know, well is well-known, no question. Uh, people know who he is, but I, I do feel like he is underappreciated as a wrestler and as a, a mind, a business Whatever mind of the business. And, and, and it's, it's unfortunate. Before, yeah, I seen it way before WCW. I got the witness it here in Florida. Yeah. And, and he started the whole devil deal and, and all that. And people thought, oh, that's too much. And it got over. You know what I mean? And, you know, he, yeah. I remember the late Blackjack Mulligan and Kevin was under the ring the whole till that match came on. They were in a cage match against Mark Lewin, uh, Purple Hayes, and uh, all of a sudden, the sold out Lakeland, Florida. All of a sudden, the board started jumping. The people went from cheering into the match <laughs> to complete silence. And you, and the boards were jumping and all that, and then all of a sudden, you see a Jagger come through the ring and shh, and all oh. Kevin Sullivan. Oh, wow. Yeah, that would have been man, awesome. Yeah. That what was, a mind! Yeah, that, that was like wow. The whole, you know, what I mean, they started beating yeah. the heck out of. No, you know what? I think it was superstar Billy Graham that was wrestling, and okay. uh, against Mark Lawrence. And then here yeah. comes Black Jack Mulligan to make the save, and uh, he grabbed the cage door, which was gimmick, and he just ripped the whole door off. Oh, wow. And, man, when he went in that ring and it, the whole building exploded. And such yeah. great memories. And But, yeah, yeah, Kevin Sullivan, one of the best minds in the business, very uh, – should have got a lot more knowledge uh, or uh, acceptance for yeah. so much he did for WCW and a lot of places yeah. over the world. Yeah, no, no question about it, so – Mr. Fidel Castro, or Castro, Fidel Sierra, excuse me. <laughs> You're not the Cuban leader. I apologize. The Cuban assassin, Fidel Sierra, thank you so much for coming on tonight. I thank really you very appreciate much. it. And listen, if anybody wants anything, I got stuff on eBay. I check that out on Fidel Sierra. Okay. And, and you can find it. And then and I am working on a book. Oh, and there you I go. I give away the name, but I, I got, it's going to be so many great. It's going to be a must-buy book. Oh yeah, I can. And I know I'm going to have to get the work. insight when you before you. I got to get the pre-order, so you got to hook me up yeah, with a exactly. pre-order. I'll buy it and everything, but I need a signed copy from you when it there comes out. There you go. There you go. All right. All hey, right. And I'm looking forward to meeting you in person in in St. Louis. And and folks, if you're in that area, get a ticket because this is going to be a big event. I mean, there's probably yeah, like 40 must, people there I know right now. It's a must-go must event. It's a yes. must-go event because yes. May, May, all did yeah. himself and uh, all the yes. vendors, like for me, Scott Wilder and all these vendors that are yeah. breaking stars. The, yes. wow. Yeah, it's May 13th 
It's the day before Mother's Day. I know that's kind of a pickle for some people, but get there if you can. Get a ticket. Meet these guys. They're wonderful people. Fidel Sierra, thank you so much for coming on. I thank really appreciate you. it. From bumps and thumps. I love it. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. And it was a pleasure, and I hope to be back soon. And I'll oh, see you in St. Louis. You will indeed. Folks, if you're watching, thank you. If you're listening, thank you. Thank you.